at Geek Pulse. You know what? I am beyond excited to have another freaking horror fiend on the channel for an interview. We have the one, the only, only Nick Grayskull. How you doing, bud? All right, man. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. Dude, pleasure. Absolutely. Us horror fiends, man, we got to stick together. We got What a tight community, brother. Um, so for all the folks watching, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and let them know what, uh, what you're about. All right. Um, my name's Nick Greystone, um, a.k.a. The Nizza. Uh, Nizza is uh, inspired by the Wu-Tang Clan. I got that years ago when I was in high school. I used to think that I could uh, freestyle rap, and it was pretty bad. But um, I figured if there was a Rizzer and a Jizzer, they could be a Nizza. So I was like an unknown member of Wu-Tang. for, And it stuck. My friends used to call me that for a long time. And... Uh, yeah, dude, I've been a horror fan, a music fan my whole life. Started at a very young age. My brother, um, my older brother, um, he introduced me to Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Motley Crue basically around the same time, like when I was about seven. And uh, I was off to the races, dude. You know, just did it like everyone else, going to mom and pop video stores and, you know, Toxifying my brain with that, going to flea markets and getting used LPs and cassettes, and uh, eventually um, starting up bands, playing music for you know over 25 years, and uh, I just recently started getting into the uh, into the horror film thing. Um, yeah. You know, six months so i mean you know it's just something uh took a little while with the music uh, with the movies but the uh the music yeah it's been a long time i've been doing that hell yeah that's that's awesome very similar trajectory man uh the og text the toby hooper texas chainsaw massacre one of the first films i ever saw as a kid um yeah. and man one of the things i'm so sad about is that the video store just doesn't exist anymore yeah. A lot of great times, man. A lot of great times. You know what? It was cool because um, back then, the clamshell, like, VHS cassette tape, like, you know, just this big, massive thing, and it's a great, like, promotion for your movie with the best art. I love that old school art, and that's just, like, walking down those aisles, man, and just picking out, like, what you're going to get in for into tonight you know like i remember you know having sleepovers because like my friends their parents weren't as cool as mine my parents really didn't censor <laughs> you know? so like they would sleep over and we'd do marathons of like faces of death and uh you know i spit on your grave and like a lot of movies that you know eight and nine year old kids maybe shouldn't be watching but like we did and uh you know Obviously, the slashers, Friday Thirteenth, you know, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, just all the the stuff, and like even back then, like when movies were coming out, like they were surprised. Nowadays, it's not a surprise. You know, like when a movie's being made, you know, like how long it's gonna take if there's any hiccups along the way. Like back then, you get a little teaser. I remember vividly sitting in a movie theater. I forget what movie it was for. But all of a sudden, I'm watching, and they're showing a teaser for a movie coming up. And a little tricycle comes out and gets trapped <laughs> with blood, and it starts melting. And, like, all of a sudden, you see, like, the diorama of the Ni Elm Street house, and they're like, Freddy's back. Boom! And the glove comes through the thing. And it was like, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. And my fucking mind was blown because I was like, ah, like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, yeah, come, it's back. Because Freddie back then, like, was like, you know, um, I mean, he's still a rock star. But, I mean, back then it was, like, unbelievable. And that was, like, the first taste of seeing it in the movie theater that I remember. You know, I saw Jason Lives and I saw Dream Warriors in the movie theater. And my dad took me with my brother to see Dream Warriors on like opening night. And I just remember that first time you see Freddie on screen, like the, the crowd went bananas, dude. It dude. was unreal. 
Yeah, Freddy was pretty much the Elvis of of the horror genre, dude. I mean, he still is, dude. You go to these conventions, and Robert England's line is fucking endless, and it's because he loves his fans. He talks to them at great lengths, almost to a point where you're like, all right, dude, you know, get someone up <laughs> on talking to you and stuff. And through the years, you know, like I've I've gone to these conventions, and it's so awesome to meet these people and ask them questions and like. Uh, and, you know, like you said, it's a tight-knit community. Dude, some of my best friends I met through, like, horror conventions, you know? And it's just, like, they're my weird extended family that I get to see two or three times a year, and it's special. Having just a convention experience, I started out with, like, a multimedia convention. Like, there's a huge one in Atlanta called Dragon Con, and they have, like, you know, sections of horror. But now I've sort of branched out to horror conventions. Robert England is some of my favorite people, period. Meeting him... It's like a dream come true, uh, you know, a nightmare come true. Um, what are some of your favorite conventions you've been to in the last year? And what are some of the favorite um, actors, celebrities that you've met in the last little bit? So my home base is really Monster Mania in Cherry Hill, Jersey. Nice. Uh, tight with the family that runs it, the Hagens. They're a bunch of great guys. Um, I go to them. They've extended it now to five a year. Uh, that being two in Cherry Hill two in Hunt Valley and one now in Oaks, Pennsylvania. And, you know, I started going to Monster Mania at Monster Mania 4. So now it's up to like Monster Mania. I think they have it 55 or something. So it's like almost 20 years of going to this certain convention. Um, I've traveled to other ones too. You know, Chilla Theater in Parsippany is another good one I go to. And uh, I've gone out to Texas Frightmare. I just bought tickets for Halloween 45 out in Pasadena, oh, which yeah. supposedly I'm hearing that Jamie Lee Curtis is supposed to headline. I'm just waiting to see that name drop so I can get to meet the queen. But uh, through the years, I have to say, like meeting these uh, meeting these actors, um, Kane Hodder has always been a favorite, no matter how many times. He's my first convention uh, guests that I ever met when I went to my first one. It was a Fangoria back in 1990 or 89. Um, he was doing promotion for New Blood. So yeah. second convention. And he, he was still on, the, you know, fresh, new to the scene and stuff. And, like, I showed him the, the Polaroid I still have of him. And, like, I've just met him i can't even tell you how many times i've gone to his table and like now he just knows me like by face <laughs> he knows my family you know i take my uh i take my daughter you know i've had some great times you know i used me and my my uh, ex-wife when we were uh when we were married we had some great times there and just like i said man it's like a family or whatever but i gotta say man kane hotter uh is definitely my favorite interaction because you know what um he's a ball buster uh <laughs> He makes you laugh, but the dude is all heart. Um, I got a quick story about that. Yeah. So they were writing a book about him. Uh, it was an autobiography called Kill. And his author, um, author Mike, they call him, but it's Mike Alo Alois or something like that. He wrote a companion to that. It was like Life on the Road with a, with a Killer. And what had happened was a couple of months uh prior to when this book was released um i have a friend that i see at conventions his name is david he's in a wheelchair and he um he came up to me one convention and he was glowing dude and i was like what's up man and he was like you know dude this awesome thing happened with uh with kane hotter and basically what happened was he went up to kane's table and he he said something to the fact of like Oh, I'll never be able to like, you know, stand up for you or do something like, you know, standing or whatever, walking or whatever the, the case may be. And Kane Hodder looked at him and said, look, dude, if you could bear hug me and stand next to me for a picture, I will give you anything on my table right now for free. And it's yours. He ended up doing it, dude. And oh. it gave this kid such like, you know a glow and like a sense of pride or whatever. And I could just see that 
And at that time, I was writing for this thing called, it was called Wrecking House Magazine. It was a zine on, online. And I wrote an article about how he has this thick shell. He's a ball buster, but he's all heart and he loves his fans and stuff. And I just wrote this article about it. And author Mike found it and he ended up putting it in the book, dude. Dude. And I heard about this and it blew my mind. I called up David and I'm like, dude, you know what? Like, this is our moment, man, where we shared. It was a special thing. You know, I wanted people to be aware of it. And now it's even more special that it's in this book. I we brought it to his attention the next convention. And ever since then, Kane Hodder is like, dude, anytime you're at a convention, you got to come up and say hi to me, man. So, man. dude, that's yeah. that's freaking beautiful. It, it really is. And it just shows that, you know, I I can't speak for any other other genre. Right. But it just appears to me that the horror genre in they love their fans. You know, they've got some of the greatest fans in the world. Uh, one of the interviews we got to do on the channel here was with Mark Holton. You know, oh yeah, I just met him this past right? week. So one of my favorite interviews we ever did, and he he had a line in the interview where he said that you know horror fans are the most diehard fans of any genre. Period. And he's been in multiple genres. I mean, you're talking about from Pee Wee's, you know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, you know. Uh, a league of their own and i had a similar story you know i was like uh because i played baseball and stuff growing up and i really like a league of their own and i was telling the story and you know we did it on the interview and later he's like hey um can we use that snippet for uh latest writing the book about a league of their own i'm like yes you know <laughs> use it in that that's that's wonderful what a great guy he was just we talked and talked and talked and talked um but a lot of these people that you see at a convention will absolutely you know, do it this sort of similar interview. Like Mark will do it. Beatrice Bupley is one of our favorites too. You know, yeah. other Kruger, you know what I'm saying? Um, and it's just, it's so much fun. You know, it's just in connecting with them because they want to feel that connection. Like yeah. a horror movie excites you through scares, but it does something to your core and your psyche. I mean, it lives within you. You know what I'm saying? You carry oh. that and they want to experience that, that energy from you. Yeah, no, man. Like I, I'm friends with you know some of these people that I've met through the years that I grew up watching. You know, like Melanie Kinnaman from uh, Friday Thirteenth Part Five, dude. Yes, he went to a, her first convention, and I was her first autograph that she had signed. And I did a little interview with her. It's on my YouTube channel, and still, like to this day, like you know, like she's seen my kid being born. She's seen my uh, my path to playing and music and everything and it's like on a personal level it's like you know i've been friends with this woman for i'm gonna say probably like 15 years and you know what she's a sweetheart and it's so <laughs> awesome that i had that connection with her you know and uh it goes for a lot you know i i've met multiple guests multiple times and you know i just i have the time in my life when i'm there and like i said it's not even about meeting them it's also seeing my extended family you know i'm i'm tight with uh a crew that puts out t-shirts they're uh they're called fright rags they're very yeah. uh, oh, sh you know like i oh. me and ben actually went when he's his first show vending was my first show going to at monster mania so i, I i'm old school fright rags fan and supporter you know i have a good friend chris ott who runs uh London 1888 Monster Heel, like he's. Damn. We I talk to him and Chris Tansky from Fright Rags every single day, man, and it's Fright just. Fright Rags is my favorite, dude. My yeah, favorite it's, merch. It, it's beyond even like the the thing. We're we're tight, you know. So it's like uh, it's a cool little uh, friendship that we've developed through the years. So I do appreciate the uh, the benefits of uh, of the horror being a horror fan and the community. I mean, it's networking. That's just like in film. You can be as a great of an actor in the world, but if you don't know the right people, if you don't connect, if you don't do these small parts, they're never going to lead to big parts. Now, I've never had the opportunity to talk with Jamie Lee Curtis. However, I was blessed to be an extra in uh, Halloween 2018 because it was filmed here in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, cool. So I was able to be in the same space with her and just witness her acting. And man, what a beautiful thing. What a freaking beautiful thing. Dude. You know what? Uh, ben has a great story about going on that set. And he said he walked into like this. Uh, it was like a gym. I'm not sure if it was Halloween or Halloween Kills. But it was the town of Haddonfield on the soundstage. And he said, dude, he walked in and he was just like, holy shit, dude. Like, 
he grew up the same way, man. You know, just watching Halloween as a young kid and then being able to be on set and rub elbows with Giants, dude, is just, it's so, you know, it's like a life, a dream come true, you know? Now, well, speaking of that, and I think that's a good segue to the next topic. I'm not just wearing this shirt for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> Thanks for this, Dude, awesome. oh, my God. Well, you got to support the, the one of the greatest things that's going to be hitting cinema soon. So there's multiple things I want to talk to you about for sales, but we're talking about legitimately one of the greatest horror icons of all time, Miss Shelley Duvall, coming back out of retirement for this movie. Yeah, man. Now, what does that feel like? What does that feel like to you? To be forever connected to that? To yes. I would have told young Nikki back in the day that, hey, man, you might be, you might be in a movie uh, with Shelly Duvall and your band is going to have three songs on this, in the movie. I wouldn't have believed it. You know, like, dude, The Shining is such a masterpiece to me uh, and to a lot of people. Like, dude, I... I can't get enough of that movie, just the performances alone and just the eeriness. It's a great movie to watch on a snowy day. Yeah. It's a great movie to watch anytime I can put it on and just, it's, it's one of my favorite horror films of all time. I mean, I have it, I have Red Rum tattooed on my wrist. <laughs> so, I mean, there, dude, you know, so, um, so how'd that whole thing happen? How did you get connected with the film? Sort of give me a little bit of backstory about the the Forest Hills. All right. So um, my friend Angela, uh, she knew this gastronologist. His name is Elliot Dresnick. He's an executive producer on the film. She connected us because she asked me if I heard about the movie. And I didn't. She sent me a trailer and it was a link to an Indiegogo campaign. So at that point, uh, the movie was basically in the bag. It was filmed. They were doing some insert shots and getting it ready for the next phase. So I looked at the trailer. It's got Eddie Furlong in it. It's got Shelly Duvall. It's got like D. Wallace. Alicia Rose. D yeah, Alicia D Rose. You know, just all these names. And I'm like, this is first off the bat. This is not your typical Indiegogo campaign because like, usually it's like, we need this money to film this film so we could start filming this film or like something like that. And it's not like, all right, well, this is post-production and we're looking for some funding for post-production to get it to the next level so we can release it. So I looked at the perks on it and it didn't have anything about music. So at that point, all I wanted to do was see if I can get somewhat musically involved with this movie. So I sent uh, a message to Elliot it took took him maybe about a day or so to get back to me. Um, he had no creative control, but he said, listen, if you contribute to the Indiegogo campaign, I'm sure we could work out a deal with you to get one of your songs into the film. But I'm going to put you in contact with the director, Scott Goldberg. So I'm like, all right. You know, I figured the guys may call me, may not call me, whatever. Dude, literally about... 20 minutes later, 15 minutes later, I get a phone call and it's Scott Goldberg and I'm on the phone with him and he's already been on my page. Now he's been looking at it, I guess for this while that I was waiting. And he's like, dude, you're like, a, you know, I love seeing like, you know, I, I dig your music. I know that you have a knowledge of movies and everything. I'd love for you to become a part of the team. So if you donate to this, a uh, certain perk on it. I'll put you in a scene with Edward Girl, uh, Edward Furlong. We'll make you an associate producer and we'll use one of your uh, songs. So just backpedaling a little bit, I was in this contest about six months before this called the Face of Horror Contest. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. What so, you're dude, that contest had 130,000 contestants from the gate. I finished 12th. Holy shit, dude. All the way to the end, dude. Now, for me, obviously I wanted to win. But you know what, dude? I saw that people actually gave a shit. That they were like, dude, go for it. I'm going to, you know, support you. People were buying me votes. It was really like such a, a, a morale boost to me. And to realize, shit, man, this is what you were made to do. You were made to rock. But you also have to get somewhere into this horror thing. So at this point, 
even my band invested in me. And I, I hit them up. I'm like, Scott, listen, that's a great offer. Let me talk to my band and see where they're at. And I'll get back to you tonight. Definitely. Conference call with the band. I'm like, dude, this movie's in the bag. This is exactly what I wanted to do, The Face of Horror. They're going to put our song in it, and they're going to put me in the movie. <laughs> Let's do it. Full, fully, and they were not no questions asked. They're like, dude, I can't believe you didn't even say you waited to ask us because they they know I have my best, you know, I have their back and best intentions. Yeah. So I hit them up. I hit Scott up. This was on a Thursday. Can you be on set on Monday? Edward's coming into town on Long Island. We can film your scene. I like the song "Hand of Kings." That's your new single. We'll put that in the movie. Boom. Monday comes along. Dude, I'm on set with Edward Furlong. I mean, holy crap! I meet Chico Mendez. You know, I met. Uh, he was there. I met Jamie Galen, who was in also Brain Scan. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Goldberg, the director. Uh, Scott Hansen, who uh, is in charge of Digital Thunderdome. Um, he's also an executive producer of the film, and it's his company that's helped shoot it, and uh, his crew, and it was just an awesome experience. I got to film it, and then um, it started from there. We had a deadline to get this movie out because the first premiere was going to be at Smod Castle Cinema with Kevin Smith hosting. Oh, holy shit, dude. Uh, that's that's a that I cannot wait for you to tell that story. Yeah. Kevin Smith is a god to me, like legitimately. Yeah. I, mean, I love it's Cthulhu, Kevin. it's Cthulhu and Kevin Smith, brother, like right up there. So yeah, yeah. tell me, like, how was that? That was amazing. That was just absolutely amazing. But even before getting to that, about two weeks after all this, he goes, "Dude, I need two more songs." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> He's like, "Send me your top five, and I'll pick two of them, and we'll put them in." So now, boom, we. He took two more songs. So now I got three songs in the movie and I'm, you know, the associate producer. So we get the film edited. We get down to the, you know, right down to the Y as we need it. And we have the first premiere. And for Kevin Smith to host it, like I said, I love every single one of his movies. Like he always gets me because I feel like I can relate to every, he, like I, I've met him before and I've always thanked him. And I said, thank you for giving me movies that I've grown with because whether it's the absolutely most ridiculous thing that happens or like those tender heart parts of his movies, I could relate to it. Yeah. So for him to host my first premiere was just another dream come true. You know, it was such a great event. The second day was a hometown one in Huntington at cinema art center. We, uh, we had to put that together within, four days because it was supposed to be in Sorgates, but they ended up canceling it because of ticket sales. They didn't promote it or anything. So I pulled all, you know, I, I had a few friends that are in connect with uh, Huntington cinema art center. And thank you to Dylan. I'm giving him a shout out right now. He's the owner. He got us in, he put us in on a Sunday. It was a very busy Sunday. It was Oscar Sunday and they have a big benefit. And he put us in like this time slot and he said, I'm going to put you in the big theater. We'll see how it goes. And, dude, just as uh, I said people are interested, my friends came through. They bought tickets. Scott's family, Scott's friends, and just word of mouth. And we pumped it out. We got Newsday involved, which is a local newspaper. News 12, which is a local uh, TV show. Everyone promoted it hard. And I believe we sold it out. It was like 200 seats or something. Dude, and, that's great. Amazing. And now to put the cherry on top of that, Kevin Smith hosted the first Q&A and moderated the Q&A and everything. Scott is an introvert. He really doesn't like talking much. He likes to show his art through his, uh, you know, show his himself through his art through the movie. Sure. So I was like, dude, if you don't have anybody to do the q and I'll do it. Because I was born to do it. So yes. Like, dude. And he did, and I hosted the Q&A, and it was just one of those moments. I'm like, man, I'm like, this is this is it, bro. I'm getting the taste now of what I've always wanted to do. And it went over very well. The reviews were good. So now where we're at with it is um, 
a major streamer right now is involved. They want the movie, but they want a little bit more horror. And okay. so right now, what we did was we launched the Indiegogo campaign. We need X amount of dollars to film insert shots. We did some uh, about two weeks ago in Atlanta. They're looking to go back to Atlanta and possibly go back to Texas and get Shelly Duvall in another scene. Oh. Um, and that was another thing, too. When we went to the Atlanta thing, at that point, you know, I had invested in the movie a little. I wanted to put more investment into it because I believed in it because it was honestly better than I expected. Like, I didn't know how good this movie was going to be. And it's not me saying it because I'm a part of it. I actually, like, genuinely enjoyed the film. Yes. So I was like, listen, Scott, man, I really want to help out in any way I can, you know. And by me giving uh, a, a certain amount into the film, they made me an executive producer to the film. So now I'm an executive producer in it. And he added me into another uh, another scene, which is like a cult scene. And it's pretty crazy. And I got bloody and it was cool. So um, they're going to do the insert shots. And hopefully when that wraps, we get down this major uh, streamer and uh, it's off to the races, dude. You know, it's uh, it's a very exciting thing. And, you know, it's it's a domino effect. Just you, you told that story so brilliantly. One thing leads to another, but you can't go anywhere without passion. I can you tell you. Go most- out without passion. You can't go without a team of yeah. people who believe in it. And it really is, man. Like everyone, you know, sacrificing themselves for it. They're putting everything that they got into it. You know, we're like. We're like an old school like metal band on the Sunset Strip right now, dude. We're putting flyers up all over the place, like Motley Crue, my favorite band, dude. That's how I see it. We're putting all our shit together and be like, yo, this is it. This is our chance. Let's get seen. We got giants in this movie right now backing us. Like, let's let let's let the world see this right now because it's the the right movie for the world to see. Because the Forest Hills is not your typical horror film. It deals with something that's very, very important right now. And it's, it's mental health. I feel like mental health right now is such a crazy epidemic going on. Yep. You know, so many, dude, everyone is affected by it. Like somebody knows somebody or it might be even themselves, you know, that, you know, it's just deals with, a, a topic that makes people, I guess, uncomfortable to talk about. And the movie sits with you with the original director's cut. The movie sits with you and you think about it. Like, did this shit really happen? Is this really going on? Or is it just like part of his mind? And that's the type of cinema that I love that sits <laughs> like hereditary. Like I watched hereditary. That movie still fucks me up. Yeah. I, fuck, yeah. That's a fucked up movie. This is a tapestry on my wall. I'll leave it up here. My queen over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Another Ariosta, he put that out, dude. That movie, like, I don't even know what the hell was going on, but, like, just beautifully shot and, like, just a mind fuck. Like, all of his, all of his films, like The Witch, like, all of yeah. the, I love so much. And A24, too, as a studio, yeah, it's dude. my favorite studio period right now you know you're in for something man when it has that little label on it dude. you do you really do man pearl and x and maxine i i'm so stoked about maxine dude i'd love to meet her i'd love to meet me a goth man She's my list way up on the list dude Absolutely. same with uh pew with uh florence pew florence. She and, really- uh, yeah she's she's something else she's her role in uh dune part two looks pretty fucking sick too yeah well, man see that i like the first one Oh, it was great. It was great. Um, and, you know, I'm definitely going to put a link to the Indiegogo campaign in the description of the video. Oh, yeah. Please. I bought the shirt. Like, I, when I saw the trailer, I was immediately hooked because it brought me back to what, why I loved horror. And, and the mental health thing. You could see right away because, like, I've had family members. I've had friends. You know, I myself have been in, you know, a darker situation. And there's nothing really darker than horror movies. And, and what a great reflection. You're looking in the mirror. That's kind of what it is. Like a horror movie, you, you're seeing the darkness, but it's shining back at you. So, uh, you know, Scott, I've had to 
wonderful time, you know, talking to him. I'd love to have him on the show. Anyone involved. I want to put the word out there because the world needs to see this film. Thank you. I Dude. really do appreciate that, man. And I do believe in Scott's vision, like, um, with adding the, the extra stuff to it, but keeping his initial, uh, point of putting this movie out, you know, because, Anyone, I, I'm not saying anyone could make a horror movie, but I feel like anyone can put together something that, you know, it's 60 minutes, 65 minutes of blood, gore, and crazy nonsense going on. But this is not that movie, man. You know, it's, it's got you, it's got you thinking, uh, the, the standout role. I think everyone really is going to go in to see Shelly. Yep. They're going to be pleased with her performance, but they're going to take home Chico with them, dude. Yeah, sure. Is a force to be reckoned with, dude. Like, he is on, and you don't even know if you're dealing with Chico or if you're dealing with Rico. I told him that. I'm like, dude, you mind fuck me. Like, bad. Like, dude, like, it's amazing. Like, where you pull this out of, like, a method actor, you know? Like, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing to watch, and it's pretty amazing to watch it on screen. You know, yeah, it's a springboard for him. Man. It. You know, seeing he, it like in front of me, like going up for the camera, and then he just pulls back and he's just like, "Hey, man," you know, he's just like a laid back dude. But then once that camera's on, boom, you know, it's on. And based on just the trailer alone, I mean, the 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 VFX looks amazing. I mean, like the you know, speak to that. Like what? Like on what level are audience expecting? Like you know, sort of. You said I, the picture in the thumbnail right now has you covered in blood. Yeah. So what was what was that process like being on set and just being covered in blood and seeing some of the effects and the the set design and all that? It actually didn't it didn't uh, almost didn't happen because obviously you know you could put a schedule out for filming a movie, but there's so many things that happen, so many takes, and you know I was originally going to Atlanta for a day, flying in one day and flying out the next, yep. and I flew in. I met my uh, my friend Savannah, who's also in the movie. And they were filming a scene with her. And, like, the day that we got there, I met my other friend, uh, Corey. She's in the film. She's actually in the scene with me. Uh, and uh, she was there with her, her man. His name is Jim. He's going to be in the movie. And um, my scene, Scott offered it to me, I think, like, I, I don't even know. I was on. I, I got there on a Monday, maybe on Sunday. He's like, yeah, dude, I'm thinking we're going to do this cult scene. I'd really love to have you in it. Uh, you might have to, you're probably going to have to stand around in your drawers only in your underwear. <laughs> you have tidy whities And I'm like, yeah, I got tidy whities All right. Back in my head, though, I'm fucking mortified because I'm like, dude, I got body issues. Like, put myself out there. I'm like, you know, I think about shit growing up that people have said to me, you know, and it's your typical, you know, fat jokes and shit and i had that in my head and i'm like oh fuck man what am i gonna do then i was thinking to myself you know what what you're gonna do is you're gonna kick your childhood insecurities in its balls you're gonna go out there and you're gonna become the motherfucker that you are when you're on stage dude and you're gonna kill it just like you always do and you just have to accept who you are man and i talked myself into it i talked myself up we're there. Um, we had to be off set by 11.30. So Savannah's thing ran a little bit late. It's about 11.15. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'm all right. I can go home. It's fine. I don't care. I got my, I'm an executive producer. I'm not going to complain that I'm not going to be in the movie. I'm already in the movie. But this is an additional thing. Scott's like, all right, dude, you're up. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, <laughs> I'm like, we got 15 minutes. He goes, look, we'll film it. We'll film you, and then we're going to insert you into the scene or whatever. We'll make it work. He's like, one good thing is you don't have to stand in your drawers. All you got to do is take your shirt off. And I'm like, fucking Hulkamania, dude. I rip it off. <laughs> fucking blood. Let's go. I poured it on. I'm all fucking bloody. I'm sticky as shit. They filmed a couple of shots of it and stuff. And I'm looking out at people, and there's about 15 people standing around on set. 
And all of them are just looking at me like, oh, my God, this dude is a fucking maniac. What, where is this even coming from? Because I'm not like that. I'm not always on, dude. Like, I'm always, you know, when I'm on stage, yeah, I'm like that crazy bastard with my eyes bugging out and I'm rocking out or whatever. But for this, this was different, dude. I'm walking around, hanging out, talking. I'm not like, you know, I'm not on. But when I was in that scene, I had to turn it on. I had to flick the switch and I got demented. And you know what, man? I, judging from the looks of everyone and everyone just like applauding after it was done, it was great. Now I just had to figure out how to get all this shit off of me to go <laughs> through TSA and fly home. So, uh, some paper towels. Thank God I always go everywhere with my baby wipes. And yep. Water and I got it off of me. My hands were dyed red for a little bit, but I try to like cover them up as much as I can going through the shit. But I got through on the plane and I got home, and that's it, man. So now, uh, they're looking at next week, they're gonna go back to Atlanta, do some shots, and then uh, possibly Texas and uh, do some shots at uh, Shelly's house. Um, Scott asked me if I'd like to go to Shelly Duvall's house. And if it's in my, uh, if it's doable, I'll do it. I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. One of the things too, uh, since the initial trailer came out and the hype for her, um, I've seen a lot of YouTubers, horror YouTubers, you know, go up to visit her in her vehicle. And, you know, and like, she seems to kind of genuinely like those sort of fan reactions when I know she's also an introvert, you know, and, and God bless her after the shit she's been through. <laughs> oh, no. It, God bless her is right, man. You know what? She got really Hollywood did her in, man, and they took her for a run and they left her high and dry. And it's a typical Hollywood tale, man. Like there was a documentary that came out a couple of years ago. It's probably almost twenty years old. It's called Searching for Deborah Winger, and yep. it was a big star at one point. And then she just said, you know, you get traded in for the newer edition, and they forget you. And that's why so many of these celebrities are doing like that plastic surgery and the Botox because they want to keep forever young, man. And, you know, it it's a shame, dude, because it's so vain. It's a, such a vain and dark fucking twisted place. And uh, you hear horror stories about it, even like, you know, the whole Me Too shit going on. with You know, that's fucking mortifying. Like, you know, that's so terrible that these poor women had to be subjected. Hey, you know what? I'll put you in my scene, but you got to fuck this fucking piece of shit to get into it. You know, it's very, it's dark. It's dark as shit. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's sad. And you know what? Shelly Duvall, uh, she, I would love to see her, um, just believe in herself to see that she still has her chops that she could still do it on a small scale. And I would love to see her make an appearance, you know, and like uh, meet fans and stuff, but she's got to do it if she's comfortable. If she's not yeah. comfortable, then you know what? She did this and this is a big step, dude, you know? For real. She doesn't owe us anything. No, she doesn't, dude. Nope. And one cool thing was um, she, she Skyped in at the Kevin Smith thing and Someone asked her, like, what was her favorite thing that she ever worked on? And, dude, it really pulled something out of my childhood. And she mentioned Popeye, dude. And yeah. like, Popeye is such a special movie to me. Like, as much as I love horror and everything, I, you know, I love all, I'm, I'm a cinephile, dude. I love all film. And uh, Popeye just brings back memories of my childhood, dude. Just like I mentioned my dad and my brother, you know, and even my mother. Like, we, had family night and just watching these movies growing up and everything. And when she said that, I thought about that, man. I'm like, wow, you know, my mom's still here. My brother's still here. My dad, unfortunately passed away. Mm -hmm. I really wish, I know he, he's watching over and everything yep. crowd and everything, but I really wish he, uh, he could have seen all this unfold, man. Cause I think, uh, he would have, uh, he's always been a supporter of mine with stuff. So I think he would have, uh, really appreciated it, you know? Dude, he is watching you, man. He's proud of you. Yeah. He is. I mean, Absolutely. you know, you're proud of yourself and that it carries over. Uh, for me, uh, I was talking with my wife, Mary, and for her, with Shelley Duvall, it was Fairy Tale Theater. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. She mentioned right. it too. Yeah. yeah. 
fairy tale theater was great, bro. Like that was such a good thing. Like growing up, man, it was, you know, it takes you away, bro. It was an escape, you know? Yep. Absolutely. Jim Henson, the Henson studios, man. Um, talk about like iconic too, you know, they're the ones that are doing the, um, the costume design and effects for the, uh, five nights at Freddy's film coming out. I'm very, uh, I'm very curious to see where that's going to go. There's a, a museum by me. Uh, it's the New York museum of film. It's in Queens. Oh, Queens or, uh, Manhattan. I think it's Queens. Uh, and they have, all some of the uh the old Muppets like set up and stuff on like the studio and it was such a cool thing to like walk through that, you know. Um and you know the Fraggle Rock and like all that, you know I love Fraggle Rock. Oh my Dude, god. Fraggle Rock was the shit back in the day. Dude, it really was. <laughs> I've been to New York one time up to Manhattan, didn't go anywhere else, not you know, well Newark and Manhattan. It would have been a dream for a long, long time. Um, got to go for literally a weekend and did as much shit as you can do. And I can't wait to come back. I love that. That's how I am with uh, L.A. You know, yeah. I said before, you know, like uh, we played the whiskey back in uh, December and that was like a lifelong dream to do. And just I love the whole vibe. I, I see myself after, you know, I retire and everything. I could see myself moving there, even though I am a New York City dude. <laughs> LA. I know it's like Neil Diamond says, dude, like New York's not my home, but LA, you know, is and like it's just I love LA too, dude. You know. Yep. Been there one time as well, going back again. Uh, my my wife's from that area, from the Antelope Valley area, right side of LA. And it's just like it's the shit you you grow up watching this and then going there. It's it's fucking magic. Did you what was the energy like at the whiskey? Could you feel the generations pass just Absolutely, dude. That's it's my Graceland. You know, like I said, I'm I'm a big '80s metal fan. I love Motley Crue. They're my favorite band of all time. They put that shit on my radar. And ever since I started in music, I knew like one day I'm gonna make it out there to play. And like, it was it was awesome, dude. Hanging out the Rainbow before and after. We ended up renting renting an Airbnb behind the Rainbow where Lemmy lived at one point. Yeah. And walk into the gig and stuff and dude it's just so many like you just look around and it's just like so many pictures all over the walls and shit and you know just a random photo i remember still like in, ingrained in my head it's like a picture of like elvira peewee herman and like sam kinnison and oh my god uh tame me down from like fast the pussycat like they're all together and like that's just the one night in hollywood dude like and that was every night every night yeah every the same situation if i had a time machine i would go back to that time i'd also go to you know 54 just one night at studio 54 yes yeah, dude absolutely insane yeah like even like the motley crew thing like so they had like this motley house that they used to live in. The three of them did. Mick Mars lived by himself because he couldn't live with the three maniacs in the group. Yeah. They rent, they shared an apartment together. It was a one bedroom apartment, Vince Neil, Tommy Lee and Nikki six. And it's literally like a hundred yards from the whiskey. So like I just walked it and I stood in front of there and I'm looking and I'm like, shit, man, I can't, they show a little glimpse of like what it was like in the movie, like from on Netflix, the dirt, but I couldn't fathom like how fucking outrageous that time was. Hey, we live up the block. We're done with our set. Come and hang out with us. And they'd have like fucking 300 kids in a one bedroom apartment. Like that had no door that because it was kicked in so many times by the cops. Like shit. I wish I could have been there for that, dude. But maybe, you know what? Maybe I wouldn't be here today if I was there. That <laughs> right. That's true. It would, chances would be, yeah. Uh, uh, same thing. I mean, it's just got, you know, Laurel Canyon all up through there, you know. Ooh. It's great shit, dude. Great shit. Yeah. Uh, so, Nick, what's next for you? Like, what's on the horizon? So, once, once you know, we, we as fans get the Forest Hills out there, you know, it gets seen. It gets picked up by that streamer. Uh, what what do you see for yourself as your next couple moves? I hopefully will. Uh, I made some networking already, and 
Scott's got some ideas for future stuff and he wants me involved. So I got that going on. Um, just, I'd like to promote the hell out of this and try to get in contact with as many people as possible to show them that how I am, how I handle my band, I'm a, a promoting maniac and I won't stop until like the whole world gets to see it. So like, I want to do that still. I want, I'm, obviously I'm going to still continue with my music. We just, uh, we just put a picture disc out. It's the, oh, uh, yeah. um, yeah. So we just put our first picture disc out. This is pretty cool. It's, uh, it was first, it was a band camp exclusive and like this, the, the response we're like, dude, we got to press this as a vinyl. So we're actually playing uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest in two weeks, uh, the, the Memorial Day weekend. So maybe about three weeks, three weeks from tomorrow. Um, and that's another dream come true, bro. Like we're uh, the first night Biohazards headlining, the second night Anthrax and Suicidal Tendencies. Uh -huh. And then the, the night that we're playing on Sunday, it's Lamb of God and Machine Head. We're kick, yeah, we're kicking off Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be out there the whole weekend. Um, I'm actually going out a day earlier because I want to drive to um, – it's in Minnesota, but Wisconsin's about an hour away. And uh, I want to go visit Chris Foley's grave, dude. Because oh, God, dude. Chris Foley has always been um, one of my idols, dude, like growing up. He was a, uh, I feel like he was a top shelf, big guy, dude. He laid it out all on the screen. Unfortunately, you know, he, uh, he burned out too fast, but, um, I even had him in my head, man, when I was doing that whole thing with taking my shirt off or whatever. And I'm like, you know what, dude, Farley did it. I could do it. And it's like an honor to like, it's, I'm honoring him, you know, and like, I want to go pay my respects to him, dude, because like he opened doors for a lot of uh, bigger dudes. You know, he passed down that torch and like, you know, I feel like uh, he's my guy. So I want to go check him out. And uh, I'm also into true crime. So 45 minutes from there is uh, the site of the farmhouse from Ed Gein. So I want to see what the fuck that we, we wouldn't we wouldn't have Psycho. We wouldn't have. You know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we, you know, oh, Ed Gein, the horror films can run, man. Ed yeah. Gein. So I got to go check that shit out. And uh, I'm going to come back. That's on, uh, you know, I, I, I land on Thursday. There's a pre-show Friday. I'll go do that during the day. Then I'll be in festival mode, you know, just networking the shit out of that. Hopefully get this opens up some doors for us. And um, yeah, man, just uh, we're in the studio right now. The band, we're tracking our new album that should be out in the first quarter of 2024 but how we do it we usually sprinkle uh singles throughout that leading up to it so that's what we'll be doing you know shit yeah man shit yeah, yeah. so if you had uh one piece of advice to give to the folks that want to break into the music business and one piece of advice for film well i can mesh them both together man because they kind do of it. And don't, and this is coming from Kevin Smith too, because Kevin Smith put this out once and I've been following it and I think it's a good thing. One of his teachers once said to him, Kevin Smith, you'll never be a successful writer. And he's always kept that little piece of paper, man. I think he has it in his wallet or somewhere really close to him. And the whole point of him keeping it is don't let anyone else write your story. You Damn. are in charge of it. So you go out and you write your story, know your self-worth. Don't give up. Don't let people tell you that your dreams are not going to come true because if you will it into existence and you go break out like all the stops and do it, even if you fail, you still win because you still believe in yourself enough to get to that point. Hey, man, you know what? I gave it my all. If you can look at yourself in the mirror, you won. I'm going to tell you this right now, and it's not just blowing smoke, brother. This interview today, I'm putting it in the same echelon as that Mark Holton interview. I mean, this is, you know, 
but it's some inspiring shit, dude, really. And like connecting with you, you know, via social media and you even just agreeing to do this, you know, you know, I, I'll, I'll ask, you know, I'll, I'll be forever in your debt, brother. And if I was there any closer to you up there in New York, man, I'd buy you a drink. I appreciate that, man. I really do, man. Your support of the film means a lot to me and, uh, really having me on, man, to, you know, talk and just be me. Hey, I'll, I'm all about that, dude. And you know what? If I could inspire anyone or even just tell my tale and let someone else see it, that's cool, bro. And, you know, it's a good thing that you're doing, dude, because you're bringing light to a lot of stuff, you know, other people, and you got fan base, so you're doing a good job, bro. That's great. Dude, I appreciate it. I'd have you on again let, just, talk, just to talk horror movies all day long. Like yeah. two episodes about horror, man, and music. Shit, that's... So we, that's could talk, we could talk all night about that shit. Damn straight, damn straight. Well, I'm going to wrap this up again. Nick's been a pleasure, brother. And you guys out there, you guys know that you are the heartbeat of this geek nation. I always have my finger on that geek pulse. Make sure to check out all of Nick's stuff. I'm going to post a link to his music, to the Forest Hills uh, Indiegogo in the description. All of it. Check him out. Thanks for watching. And I'll check you guys later. Peace, brother. Peace, brother. Thanks.